if you want to follow along with slides, you can't see for that reason. We're available at slides.lukeb.co.uk slash NEKS2019. Um, yeah, so you can go there. Um, I have a few content warnings. So I have videos, animations, loud noises when I'm shouting at my laptop, and uh, flashing lights. Content warnings will appear down in that bottom corner. Um, and that is actual content warning at the minute um, because the next slide does have a little bit of animation. So yeah, I'm Luke Bonacorsi. Um, my pronouns are he, him, his. Uh, I am a software engineer at Sky Betting and Gaming in the UK where gambling is fully legal and regulated. Um, it's an online gambling company uh, based in Leeds in the north of England. Uh, where I also organize Leeds GS, which is our local JavaScript meetup. Please get involved in your local JavaScript meetups. They need all of the help that you can, they can get. Um, whether it's speaking or just attending or helping out, they need your help. Um, yeah, I tweet at Code Food Pixels, which are my three favorite things. Uh, I blog at lukeb.co.uk. Sorry, I'm just adjusting things here because uh, there we go. Uh, and yeah, I'm a hardware noob. Uh, I live in fear of constantly burning my house down by building all this stuff that I'm going to be talking about. <laughs> and I'm lazy. If there's a way I can not do something, I won't do it. Um, seems pretty obvious. And because I'm lazy, automation's a great thing because I can just automate away the boring things. And in everyday life, we are surrounded by automation and probably don't realize it. So there's stuff like traffic lights, automatic doors, motion sensing lights, automatic hand dryers, and cash machines, which you call ATMs here. Um, and that's just the stuff I've sort of noticed and paid attention to today. And it shows how prevalent it is in our everyday lives. It, it's everywhere. There's probably stacks of it in this room that I haven't noticed or that you haven't noticed either. And as consumers, we're embracing automation more and more in our homes with stuff like heating with the Nest thermostat or lighting with the Philips Hue bulbs. And even Ikea have gotten in on that with some really cheap hardware for it and access control with smart door locks. <laughs> and these usually have APIs so that you can interact with them. You can write a script and run it from the command line so you can feel like a hacker with like your terminal and making things happen. Or you can write a node service and have like a really nice dashboard with all your different things connected to it. And over the past few years, there's been what I've decided to call a bot uprising. Um, they're becoming more and more a part of our lives um, and helping us with everyday things. And these things can be hooked up to a single chat system, or you can use a framework to get multiple. So you have no modules for stuff like Slack, Facebook Messenger, uh, and all the other ones. Uh, and it means that you can really quickly build a single purpose bot just for your Slack instance. Um, or you can use a framework like Microsoft's bot framework or botkit that means that you can build a bot that does multiple things and connects to multiple chat systems. And then on top of that, virtual assistants are becoming more and more popular. So you've got Siri, Alexa, and Google Assistant, which are basically bots, but a lot smarter because they're backed by huge data farms. And they're in our homes and helping us with our everyday lives. So we've got the Echo, the HomePod, and the Google Home as devices you can buy and put in your home. And they help you out with things. So reading news that you're interested in, playing music, buying things, controlling your home automation. And the uprising's only just beginning. It's going to get more and more common and more and more powerful. So mid-2014, I started working on my own chatbot. It's called Woodhouse. It's named after the butler on the TV show Archer. And I see a few people smiling as I say that. That always happens. It's great. Um, I was going to call it Jarvis, but Jarvis is really, really overdone. And it wasn't going to be anywhere near as good as Jarvis, so I picked a worse butler. <laughs> uh, it's all open source and written in JavaScript. Uh, it runs on a Raspberry Pi running node behind my TV. Uh, it's all MIT licensed because if you can pick it apart and do what you want with it, go for it. Uh, and it's all up on GitHub. The link to it's at the end. 
Um, it's modular and extensible, so the core is basically just a router with some common functionality, such as broadcasting, so that pieces can talk to each other, scheduling, so that you can time certain bits, and preference storage. And then there are two types of modules. So you've got plugins that do pretty much whatever you want. They do the heavy lifting. Um, so whether it's replying to you with text, or connecting to APIs, or interacting with hardware, uh, and then you've got interfaces, which are ways to communicate. So it's generally a chat system, and it's generally the, the node modules that I mentioned earlier for connecting to Slack and stuff, and a little bit of glue code to, to connect it all together. So in the beginning, I only wanted to download movies. Um, my friend Tom, we were sat in a meeting. We both worked at the same place. Um, and he was SSA, uh, VPNed into his Pi at home, and he was downloading movies. And that seemed like a lot of effort to me to like set up all of that. Um, I already knew of software that could download stuff for me. Uh, it had an API, so I could set something up at home, have a chat system, send it a message. It comes back and says, is this the film that you meant with an IMDb link? And then I can reply yes or no. If I reply yes, it goes and downloads the movie. But before I did that, I end up automated my lamps. I don't know how. It just, like, I have... I can go through my photo history and just there suddenly is a photo of the plug that I bought. I have no context. <laughs> so this is me sending a message and turning off my lamps and then sending another one and they turn back on in a minute. And when I first did this, I was just sitting, sending messages, giggling to myself <laughs> because... As web developers, we don't get to see this, this real world thing happening. We get to see a button change color or something move across the screen or maybe a little game, but it's still not a physical thing. I felt like a god because I was making things happen. <laughs> um, so yeah, this is the plug that I use. It was, um, it's a, about a $15 plug. It's probably a lot cheaper now um, from China. Uh, which means I have to use an adapter because it's got the Chinese plug on the back, which means it's really safe. Um, and I found out that you could tell that into it by poking around, and it's only within the local network you can do that, so it's at least sort of secure. Um, and then I found a Google group that had also been playing around with it, and they'd found the SSH password. Um, and it runs OpenWRT, which is a router firmware. Uh, it's a little Linux distribution, and it's got a web server on it. So you could drop scripts on and hit the web server and make it do stuff. So I have a script where you hit it with one parameter and it turns the relay inside it on. And then you hit it with a different parameter, it turns it off. So it's got an API now. And then you hit it with a different one and you get the status of it so you can tell whether it's on or off without actually having to trigger it on or off. Um, and then I have another script that sits on it and every two minutes it broadcasts the name of the plug. Um, the IP and the tags so that Woodhouse can pick it up and knows what to do with it. Uh, and then a page so that I can configure all that. I don't have to go in SSH and type all the stuff because that's laborious. <clears throat> and I use this every day, not whilst I'm here, obviously. Um, but I can send a message as I'm getting towards my house when it's dark and the lights are on. Or when I'm in my car, I use Google Now and shout, OK, Google. And tell it to send a message. I might have triggered a load of people's phones there, I'm sorry. Um, but it means that I get home, the lights are on, I'm not stepping on anything that's been put through the door. I, I can just walk in and it's done. And then I began adding other little bits. So I eventually added the film and TV downloaders, but I never used them because Netflix became a thing and that's way easier. <laughs> um, but I can use it for like checking if websites are up or sending me reminders so I can put a pizza in the oven and send a message to tell it to give me a reminder, reminder and it will because pizza is, burnt pizza is terrible. I don't want to burn my pizza. And then I had all these other ideas of things that I want to do. And then I started rewriting it because developers, we love to refactor things. And... I'd actually been getting really excited as I was writing it and just sort of throwing code at it, and I had this mound of mess. Um, 
And yeah, I knew how it worked, so I could start again and write it in a way that, that made sense. And it meant that I got to use the S6 and all the nice stuff that came with that. And it just worked because Node had gone through the whole IOJS split and stuff by that point that we had ES6 in actual Node. And then the first time that I gave this a version of this talk, I wanted something new. So I automated my curtains. So I send a message and they open. And it's really loud. That's not like the volume turned up. That's just the servo making a lot of noise. <laughs> um, I also imagine it's really creepy looking from the outside. <laughs> Especially, like, if I just put a chair in the window and did it, and just, like, people walking past seeing me just staring in the windows. <laughs> um, but, yeah, like, the parts for it were pretty basic. Um, I either bought them from eBay, the hardware shop, or a supermarket. Um, so there's a plastic box, which I bought from a supermarket, a servo, some string, some plastic wheels, and some hardware to mount it onto the curtain rail. Um, and the way it works is sort of like this. So there's a loop of string at the top of the curtains. Um, the curtains are attached either side of the, the string. Um, and if it rotates one way, they open. If it rotates the other way, they close. And it's not great, but it worked. Um, and then the brains are running on this, which is an ESP8266. Um, it's a microcontroller like an Arduino. It's got Wi-Fi. It costs like $2 from China. Um, and I use the firmware called Mongoose OS, uh, which means that I can write JavaScript. And I wrote about 75 lines and got endpoints for open, close, state, and the status, um, the ability to configure it so that I can have it know which curtains I was controlling, and then broadcasting so that Woodhouse could pick it up. And there's so much cool stuff for hardware. So I mentioned Mongoose OS, but there's a load of other stuff. So you can use Johnny5 and Cylon.js on uh, an Arduino or, or an Arduino tethered to a computer or on a Raspberry Pi. And then you've got Modable and Esperino and Tessel, which they make actual boards for you to buy. They're a bit more expensive, but if you want that first class experience, then it's great. And you can also flash Esperino and Modable onto your own devices, onto your own boards, so that you can just buy inexpensive boards and just flash it on. Um, which means that if you break the boards, it's less of a worry. Um, and there's loads more of this stuff on the web. I, I am not a source of all this stuff. Um, I keep finding more. Um, but being able to use a, a language that you know, like JavaScript, makes it really easy to just get stuck in with hardware. And then I got bored over Christmas in 2016 um, and started sharing on my laptop. But it wasn't out of frustration. Um, it was so I could get voice control. We have turn off lamps. Caroline has been turned off TV lamp, has been turned off couch lamp, has been turned off. We have turn on lamps. Caroline has been turned on TV lamp, has been turned on couch lamp, has been turned on. <laughs> So it's got the worst reply, reply voice ever, um, but that's because uh, it's the default in Festival, which is an open source te uh, text speech on Linux. Uh, I've tried to see if there's anything better and that's kind of the best I've found. Um, so I guess that's the voice for Woodhouse now. <laughs> it uses off offline hot word detection um, using a thing called Snowboy. Uh, you go to their website, you shout at it three times, and it gives you a lot of files to download, which means that it's not constantly listening to me and sending data off. Um, and then I use the Google Speech API for the main part of it um, because they have a lot more data than I will ever have about speech recognition. And anything that I tried offline for it was just not great. Um, but Google give you 60 minutes free a month, uh, batched up into 15 second blocks. You could use Azure Amazon instead. They have very similar um, free tiers. And even if you go over it, it's still reasonably priced. Um, but yeah, this takes the what you've said, converts it into text, sends that to ma the main hub. The main hub carries out the action and then sends the response back. And I've actually built the fir my first standalone voice unit 
um, to scatter around my house. So this is the first one. It's got uh, it's, the case is 3D printed. It took like five hours. That's because I set the resolution really low. It was going to take 15. Um, it uses a Raspberry Pi Zero for the main part of the brains, um, the one with Wi-Fi. Uh, it's got a PS3i for the microphone, which is like the webcam that you could buy for the PS3. Um, it's pretty cheap now. It's like five bucks, um, but it's got a four microphone array at the top, which is really good for being able to shout it across the room because they were sort of designed for that. Um, and then just a bog standard speaker and an audio amplifier board, and it means that I can shout it. Turn on upstairs lamps. So my, my phone didn't pick up the sound pretty well on that, but it's pretty loud. Like I can stand at the bottom of my stairs and shout at it and hear it, um, and it picks me up. Um, which is great. It's still got the same cerebral voice, but I decided to make my own sounds for it so that it sounds a bit like more me. And then I'd like to introduce you to a brand new revolutionary entry into the smart heating ar arena. It's JavaScript based, it's Wi-Fi enabled, it's a thermostat. It's got incredible timeless design, and it's crafted from the finest materials. It's got the ability to boost and pause. You can set a minimum temperature so that the pipes don't freeze. Uh, it's got an API uh, to change the settings. It's hooked up to Woodhouse because why wouldn't I? Um, so this was the thermostat that was in my previous house. Uh, I live in a rented. Uh, I live in rented houses at the minute, um, and yeah. This wasn't accurate. Like you'd set it to one temperature and never actually reach that temperature. Um, and I found out that you could pull that plastic wheel off and it had a potentiometer behind it that had a little notch. So I thought I can 3D print a thing for this. And so I 3D printed a wheel that can sit on top of the potentiometer with a notch in it. And the wheel then attaches to a servo and then a 3D case holds the parts. So the unit sits on the front like that. Uh, it's got schedule, checks the temperature every couple of seconds to decide whether or not it should be turning the heating on or off. And then it basically turns the potentiometer to maximum or minimum, depending whether it should be on or off. It's a very manual, it works. I connected my heating to the internet. <laughs> so the parts for this are there. Um, there's an ESP8266, the same as earlier, running Mongoose OS for the, the brains. Uh, there's a temperature sensor. There's a resistor because the internet told me I needed one. <laughs> and a servo to turn the dial. Um, the main part of it was dealing with the code. And this ran my heating over winter 2017. Uh, it made it way easier to control and see what temperature it was. Um, I even went away and trusted it not to freeze my house, and it worked. I was surprised. <laughs> um, and I plan on making it eventually a bit smarter, having it maybe predict things a bit better. Um, but I moved house last year, and I now have to figure out how to connect it by RF, um, which I have no idea, because I have to like decode how the current one works, which is a whole, like, extra set of things that I have no idea about. And then there's my most recent project. So like I said, I moved house last year. And I don't have curtains in my new house. Every room has vertical blinds. And I want to automate these, but I don't want to take them apart because, yeah, I'll break them. Um, so I designed a gear that's split into two parts that I can retrofit around the rod that sits across the top of the, uh, the blinds, and I can bolt it together. And then I have a case that dangles off of the blinds, and it has a couple of gears in it, so I can mount a server that has a gear on that and take it from a one to, uh, from 180 degrees rotation on the servo is like five turns of the actual rod. Um, but I'm not great at mechanics or measuring, so this is the graveyard of the cases that didn't work. Um, 
and they take two and a half hours per side to print. So like if I do a whole case, it's like five hours. Um, and I still don't have it working. Uh, but I was trying really hard to get it done for this. But on Saturday, I realized that I needed a more powerful servo, which meant I'd have to redesign the whole case, which I'm not doing when it takes five hours to print a whole case. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not doing that. Um, but I do have the software working. Hey, what else? Open lounge lines. You can see the hey, what house? Closed lounge lines. So, so basically, I've got a server that's got an API, um, which I'd never thought that a server would ever need an API. But I can send it like a degree. And it will send it will set it to that degree, which is really useful for when I actually have it in context, but on its own is pointless. But I do get to say that I can shout at my servo and it works. Um, so that's the story so far. It's an ongoing thing. It's like it, I, I've given this talk three times to Trent um, <laughs> over three years. And it, it's constantly changing, stuff's being added to it all the time because it's a project that I really enjoy. So what about the future of it? Well, I want to finish off my blinds. Like the first thing I do when I get back will be like cracking on with that and trying to get it finished. Because yeah, if I can control my blinds and not have to get up and do that, that's great for me. Um, and then I want to do a recipe system like I have triple T so that I can have it, my phone connected to the network and it's dark outside and it can turn on the lamps, close the blinds, and, and do it all for me. So I don't even have to say anything. It just works. And I've started planning a version three of it. And I have like a load of notes for that already. And I will probably start on that at some point in the future. Um, but that includes natural language stuff as well. Because if you heard when I was doing the voice control stuff, it was very linear. Uh, Woodhouse turn on lounge lamps, which doesn't feel natural because the word the should be in there somewhere. And then more hardware. I've really enjoyed learning hardware. Um, so I have an idea of how to do a door lock, which is probably not the greatest idea, <laughs> but I'm going to do it anyway. Uh, and then light switches as well, and other things like that. And I'm genuinely terrified of the prospect of home, home ownership, not because of having a mortgage and being like a responsible adult, but because I'll probably burn it down. <laughs> So at the start of this talk, I said I was lazy, and I need to correct that. I'm the ridiculous kind of lazy where I'll spend hundreds and hundreds of hours making things so that I don't have to do simple little tasks, like opening my curtains and turning on my lamps. But it goes further than that. I'm not here just to show off all the cool stuff that I built. I'm here with the aim of inspiring you. I want to show you that you can do a load of really, really cool stuff with JavaScript, stuff that you haven't necessarily thought about. And I've learned so much whilst doing this. So I learned a load about JavaScript itself. I learned ES6 doing this. I learned about UDP and some stuff about hardware. And I kept sort of finding new things and just diving into them and, and following it and just going down the rabbit hole. And I'd, I'd find it interesting which meant that I was driven to keep going. I even used this stuff to connect my Christmas jumper to the internet. <laughs> um, so you can change how these lights act on a web page. Uh, this is actually a video of my friend Beth controlling them from her house. <laughs> And I got a 3D printer because of this, like solely because of this stuff. Um, I printed the case for the thermostat and the stuff for my blind automation, but it makes stuff really easy because I can just prototype by, here's a design, print it, here's a design, print it. And if it doesn't work, I just make a new one. I don't have to wait for new stuff to come from a, a manufacturing place or have to figure out how to like actually build things. And I realized a great parallel whilst working on this talk, that one of my other big passions is food and cooking. And if you were learning to cook, 
you would learn by cooking stuff that you wanted to eat. You, there's no point in cooking stuff that you don't like because you're just going to taste it. It's like, meh. So you want to make things that you, that you like. There's no point if you're not interested in it. And in the same vein, when you're learning, build something that's weird and interesting to you, if you can. It'll keep you invested. It'll, you, you can hack it. You can cut corners. You can refactor it. It doesn't have to be the perfect project. It just has to be. You're building it for yourself. You can show it off if you're happy to. People are usually interested, but you don't have to share it. People will probably be interested. <laughs> So thank you very much. <laughs>